I'm with the Living Coast Discovery Center. My name is Janani. I'm one of the education specialists here. Um, we're a small zoo and aquarium. We're located in South Bay of San Diego um, in Chula Vista, and we're located right on the Sweetwater Wildlife Refuge. So we're in a really unique spot here to see a lot of our native San Diego plants and wildlife, and that's kind of our focus. So I have three of our animals here. These are all animals you can find around San Diego County. Um, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time with each of them. Again, if you guys have any questions, please throw them into the Q&A. Um, my coworker Haley is checking that out. So she'll either throw those questions up to me to answer live or she'll drop an answer in chat for you. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with our first animal. All right, so you're gonna have to bear with me as I move my camera here. So we have in here, cause I can't bring this animal to the camera. We've got in here a swell shark. So this is a juvenile swell shark. Let me get my hand in here kind of for scale so you guys can see this swell shark right now. He's about a foot and a half long. Kind of see my hand as comparison. He is a juvenile swell shark. So that means he is a young swell shark. These guys, when they're full grown, will only reach up to about three to four feet. So they're not a very large species. They are bottom dwellers. So primarily we're gonna see these guys hanging out at the bottom of San Diego Bay, pretty much doing what you see right now. Um, they're a nocturnal species, so they're more active at night. So during the day, they're pretty much just gonna be hanging out like this. They're gonna be eating mollusks, so shellfish, things like mussels, clams, and snails. And their coloring, you guys can see that kind of brown and tan banded coloring is going to help them to camouflage with the rocks and the mud down at the bottom of the bay. Because they're a smaller species, they do have predators, especially when they're young, when they're about this size. Oh, there he goes, you woke up a little bit for us. So, this guy is a, um, as I said, a juvenile. He is about one to two years old right now. Um, and I, I am saying he, um, I don't actually, we don't actually have a sex on this guy yet. We won't know until they hit maturity, whether it's male or female for sure. Um, I'm just kind of guessing at this point. And these guys are really cool. They actually get their name Swell Shark from an adaptation they have to protect themselves from predators. So if these guys are threatened, they'll go to hide in a rock crevice. They'll find a little space in between some rocks, wiggle themselves in there, and then they'll suck in a bunch of water and basically puff themselves up like a balloon. And that'll actually, that'll wedge them in between the rocks. So if a predator comes up to them, they won't be able to pull the shark out of the rocks there. Let me see if I can get the camera. There you go. You guys can see his face a little bit better now. So he's got, you can see the eyes up front there. They're fairly small. These guys don't have great eyesight. Um, bottom dwellers typically don't have a lot of eyesight because you don't have, you don't get a ton of light down there at the bottom of the ocean, especially when they are active at night. So they're gonna be relying on their other senses, primarily their sense of smell. Um, sharks also rely on other senses. So they have something called a lateral line, which is common to all fish. And that lateral line is going to help them sense vibrations in the water. All right, so yeah, this guy here, again, just kind of for scale, you guys can see. So their skin is another really cool adaptation that sharks have. So their skin is going to be, it's gonna feel a lot like sandpaper when you touch them. And it's gonna be smooth kind of in one direction going from head to tail. And then if you go tail to head, it's much rougher. And that's due to their skin. They have something called dermal denticles, which is basically little, their scales, they basically have little scales on their skin, they look kind of like teeth. Um, and that's going to make their skin very rough. It's gonna help protect them against, you know, bumps and scrapes, bumping into rocks. Um, it's also going to help with their, help make them more um, hydrodynamic, make it easier for them to move through the water. All right, do we have any questions jumping in there, Haley? All right, do you guys have any questions about this little swell shark? Please let us know. Uh, 
Um, also, another question we commonly get when we do this is what this guy is here. Um, so this is a bubbler, which is basically, it's putting oxygen in the water. He doesn't stay in this container permanently. He's just in here. So it's a little easier for us to show him on camera. He'll, and so we wanna make sure he has lots of oxygen. He does breathe oxygen, same as we do, but he has gills on the side. If you look carefully on the side, right in front of those fins, you may be able to see his gills opening and closing. So that's the equivalent of our lungs. They're pulling oxygen out of the water for him to breathe. You have one question. Okay. How big can they get? Yeah, so these guys at full adult size, they'll get about three to four feet long um, and they'll get a bit wider. So if he's, you know, right now he's about that wide when fully grown he'll get up he'll get you know maybe that wide across like so from you know flipper to flipper on this side for those front flippers and then head to tail he'll be maybe three to four feet stop moving around you can show off on camera Uh, something else that's kind of fun about these sharks and other sharks as well is their patterning is unique to each shark. So that individual pattern of the shape of his stripes and those lighter kind of yellowish dots you see, those are unique to every single shark. So by documenting those, that's actually what, how we tell our small sharks apart is by knowing what those patterns are and keeping track on them. It gets extra tricky when they're little because those dots tend to kind of move around and change shape as they grow. So we have to keep really close track of them as they grow to make sure we're tracking their markings appropriately. We have another question. What oceans are they normally found in? Yeah, so these guys, like I said, they're a local species. So we find these guys in San Diego Bay. Um, they do prefer colder water. So you're not gonna find them in too many like tropical areas, areas down like, south in like you know Baja and Mexico you're not going to find them too much there but you'll find them up and down the California coast they tend to like shallower water so they won't be out in the deep deep ocean you'll find them closer to the coast along the Pacific coast they eat shellfish so things like clams mussels and snails That's a good question. Um, so no, um, I mean, so let me rephrase that. So these guys, it may have happened that these guys had bitten a human. Um, our rule, the rule of anyone who works with animals will tell you anything that has a mouth can bite. Um, I know more than one biologist that's been bitten by a snail before, believe it or not, right? So anything that has a mouth can bite. Um, animals are mostly going to bite in self-defense, right? When they feel really threatened and they need to protect themselves. So I'm sure there has been a case where a horn shark has felt threatened enough, or sorry, a swell shark has felt threatened enough to bite. However, what I think your question was is, are they dangerous to humans, right? Can they do damage? And the answer is no. These guys are not aggressive as all, at all. There are very, very few sharks in the world that are aggressive to humans. They're not aggressive at all. Their, their first instinct is going to be to get away from you. Um, and then um, they also, because they're so small, their mouths are also very small. You obviously, you can't see on him because his mouth is on the underside. His mouth is about this big and his teeth are about the size of the hook end of Velcro. So if you think about like the, the hard end of a piece of Velcro, that's kind of what his teeth are like. So they're not very large. They're not very sharp. Um, they're not, you know, he's designed to eat snails and clams. He's not going to do any damage to a person. Um, well, this one hurt and is that why he's out the side? That's another good question. So this one, um, he was actually born in captivity. Um, he wasn't born at our aquarium. He was born at another aquarium and came to live with us. Um, but because he was born in captivity, he cannot be released in the wild. So he lives here with us and we're able to use him and his friends as ambassadors for his species to help teach people about how awesome sharks are because sharks get a pretty bad rap in the world and they're really incredible animals.
does he have any friends? Uh, he shares, right now he shares an enclosure with his siblings. So we have two other swell sharks that are about the same age. Um, so they all share an enclosure together. Um, when they get bigger, um, they'll go out and live in our larger shark enclosure. So that's a multi-species enclosure with a lot of other type, um, several other species of shark and several species of fish um, of all different sizes that can all be found in San Diego Bay. So when he gets to be adult size, he'll go to live in like a, big, a bigger enclosure that's mixed with a lot of different species. Right now, he just hangs with his siblings. How many sharks do you have? Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I could give you a count right now. Um, I can tell you species for certain. We have leopard sharks, horn sharks, swell sharks, and gray smooth hounds. Am I missing anybody? That's, so those are the species, we have four species. And again, those are the four species we most commonly find in San Diego Bay. Um, however, um, and so as far as numbers, gosh. I think we have the three swell sharks. We have maybe three dozen, 30 to, four, 30 to 40 sharks in total. Mm, so natural predators, um, especially when they're young is gonna be anything carnivorous that's bigger than them. Um, so any sort of larger shark species, um, depending on where you are on the coast, if you're up out of the bay, you'll, you'll find, we'll find hammerhead sharks and things like that would definitely go after these guys. Um, so maybe a sea lion, sea lion or a seal would go after these guys. Um, um, and again, when they're this small, even a, a bird, a fishing bird, so a pelican or an osprey would, or a cormorant might go after them when they're adults there's fewer things that would go after them, probably limited to a much larger shark or a seal or sea lion. How often do they... Oh, good question. Again, it's gonna vary as they age um, when they're little. Um, and in the, oh, let me rephrase. It's gonna vary in the wild. So here at the center, they get offered food twice a day. Um, so, and that's kind of, that makes them happy and healthy. In the wild, they're gonna eat when they can get food, basically. So they might eat, you know, a bunch of food one day and then not get any food for a couple of days after that. Uh, that's really common for predators in the wild. Um, so it's going to kind of depend on their circumstances. But here at the center, he gets offered food twice a day. He, they don't always eat twice a day, but they get offered twice a day. All right, um, am I time? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch my camera back here. So bear with me for a moment. Can you organize, can you organize me? Yes, all right. So I'm gonna go off camera for a second. I'm gonna grab our next animal. All right, so we're, we're moving on to land a little bit here. So this is Indy, and Indy is a chuckwalla. A chuckwalla is a species of lizard that we find in our deserts primarily here in San Diego. Um, so Indy is a full-grown chuckwalla. If he'll cooperate here, I'll try to move him so you guys can see how long he is. Come on, buddy. There we go. So you guys can kind of get a sense of how big he is now. So he is a full grown chuckwalla. So he is about, including his tail, he's about a foot and a half long. Um, his tail makes up about, well, about two feet long. So he's about a foot of body and then about a foot of tail. Um, so he's got a, his tail's pretty much as long as his body is. And you guys can see he's a pretty active guy. He is, these guys are going to be climbing and digging. Um, so he's gonna be climbing on rocks and bushes and things like that. He's also going to be digging burrows. Um, so these guys are going to, especially when they're out in the desert, when it gets really hot, 
they're going to be digging burrows to you know get themselves some shade get out of the sun um, and then when it, they want to pick up if they want to bask in the sun warm up after a cold night they'll hang out on a rock so they need to be able to climb up those these guys are going to be um, insectivores so they eat um, plants um, so they'll eat plants and they'll also eat insects. So he usually gets a mix of those two things. The majority of his diet is going to be plants. So here at the center, he gets plants um, four to five days a week and bugs two to three days a week. Um, but so the mostly plants, the occasional bug as well. You guys can see by his coloring. Let me kind of move him so you can see. I know I moved. You guys can see his his coloring here. So he's got that kind of pattern, the kind of pink spots going down his back and that gray and brown coloring. So those pink, those pink spots there, that's actually just unique to Indy. Not all Chuck Wallace have that pattern. That's just his, his unique coloring. Um, but that kind of gray and brown is very common. That's pretty typical for Chuck Wallace. That's gonna help them to camouflage again with the rocks that they like to hang out on. Hi. And then you can see, hopefully, he's got those really long toes there with the nails on the end. So those are gonna be really, because they're so long, they're really excellent at climbing and kind of wrapping around things. As you saw earlier with him kind of climbing up my arm. We do have two questions. All right. So our first question is, is his bite poisonous. Ooh, so he is not venomous. So I say venomous um, because when we talk about an animal's bite, it's venomous. Poisonous is usually we mean if you eat that animal and you get sick, it's poisonous. If it bites you and you get sick, it's venomous. So like a rattlesnake or kimono dragon, those are going to be venomous animals. Um, Andy is not venomous. Um, he's not dangerous at all to humans. And then our second question is, what is his favorite bug? Ooh, his favorite bug. Um, he likes mealworms a lot, um, but he also likes crickets. And then as far as plants go, he basically gets a salad every day. So it's green, so he gets things like kale and Swiss chard. Um, and lettuce, um, but he also will get things like carrots and sweet potatoes and zucchini cut up really small for him. And then as a treat, sometimes he'll get fruit. So he'll get um, whatever fruits in season. So this over the summer, he likes berries. He gets blackberries a lot, um, all that kind of stuff. Obviously in the wild, that's not what he'd be eating, right? You're not gonna find too many lettuce plants out in the desert. So he'll eat the leaves of whatever plant is in his area. Um, there are some plants that make have berries that are native to San Diego. So we have things like salmon berries and lemonade berries that we find out here and he'd, he'd eat those as well. Um, or any plant that has edible flowers, edible seeds, he'd go for it. Or maybe not seeds, but any plant that has sort of edible flowers, edible leaves is what he'd go for. How many crickets do we give him in a meal? Oh, uh, what are you getting now? So that number changes depending on the time of year because he's a reptile, he's cold blooded. So he is less active in the colder months of the year and more active in the warmer months. So when he's more active, he obviously is hungrier, he eats more. Um, so in a meal, he, not a ton of crickets, maybe three or four crickets in a meal for him, um, even in the summer. So during the winter, it may go down to one or two, or what's more common is, um, like I said, with the shark, um, he probably, he might eat three or four bugs one meal and then not want any food for a couple of days after that because he was really full. Um, so it kind of depends on the time of year for him. Um, is he normally burrowed uh, where he lives in the wild or does he hang out more on top? Yeah, so his preference, um, he's mostly going to want to hang out in the sun, um, hanging out on a rock, um, like in, in the, his enclosure, that's frequently where we find him. Um, if he's just hanging out looking for food, um, if he's sleeping, he's gonna want to be burrowed somewhere safe. So we'll find him 
Um, he'll kind of dig partially under a rock and like make himself a little cave. Um, and that's what he likes to do mostly when he's sleeping. Are his fingernails sharp? Yes, they are. Um, they're not very big. So I mean, obviously I'm handling him with my bare hands. So they're not very big. Um, I do have this, this wrist wrap on that's actually really thick fabric. So that's to help protect the inside of my arm because that's pretty sensitive, right? So that the, uh, so that's so he doesn't scratch up the inside of my arm as he's climbing on me. Um, but like, I can feel his nails, they kind of poke, but they don't hurt. And like, he's not making me bleed or anything. Does he eat insects with his tongue like a chameleon? Ooh, good question. Um, so he doesn't have the long tongue like a chameleon does, um, but he does use his tongue, um, but more like how you use your tongue to eat. So it's not like long and sticky like a chameleon. So he's more gonna use it to like kind of help him move the food into his mouth so he can chew it up. How does he catch his food? How does he catch his food? Uh, he runs after it and bites it, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah, he just uses his mouth and grabs onto it, um, bites it with his mouth. He seems slow, so is he fast? Yeah, so right now, this is, this is like indie walking speed, kind of what you see him doing on my hand. He obviously can't go very far because I'm holding him. Um, so this is kind of walking speed. He can go faster than this when he wants to. I've seen him like book it across his exhibit um, if there's something exciting or he's scared of something. Um, so he can go uh, faster if he wants to. So if you imagine this is kind of his normal walking speed and then he can run. Um, but he's not, so he's, he's about average. He's not super fast, you're right. So he wouldn't be going after probably any like flying insects or anything like that. He really wouldn't be able to catch them. So he'd try to, you know, sneak up on a beetle or a worm or something like that that he could, you know, get a hold of. Can he run away easily? Yes, yeah. So he's from a predator or something like that. He would definitely be able to run away. He's also really going to rely on his camouflage. So if he's threatened, like I said, he, he likes to hang out, you know, kind of in between rocks, in little caves between rocks. Um, so if he's threatened, his first instinct is going to be to get into one of those safe spaces and try to blend in. And it, it's, it might be hard to tell on the camera, but his, his sides here, he's not, hot, he's not very firm on his sides. You might be able to see he has a lot of loose skin along his sides. So his sides are pretty squishy. Um, and so when he needs to, he can kind of contort the, this middle part of his body. So he can kind of flatten himself out like a pancake and kind of pick himself up. So he'll do that. He'll use that to be able to kind of wiggle in to really tight crevices in the rocks um, so that the predator can't get in after him. Um, he's actually kind of famous at the Nature Center because he will get into ridiculously tiny little crevices in his enclosure. He'll get behind his he'll do all sorts of crazy stuff so we'll walk by and be like oh my gosh where's Indy and he's in some weird corner we didn't think he could get into still in his enclosure but like he's gotten himself hidden somewhere we can't see him so they're they're really really good at that um, if he ran away from the discovery center would he be okay in the wild it's a good question so um like the shark Indy was born in captivity um, so it is unlikely that he would be able to survive in the wild. He's never had to hunt his own food. He's been fed, you know, every day of his life. He's never had to deal with predators or anything like that. So um, it is unlikely that he would be, he would do really well on his own out in the wild. Um, as far as the habitat goes, this is the, the appropriate habitat for him. So it's not like, you know, it would be too cold or too hot. Um, it's just because he, he, has never had to figure it out before, he probably wouldn't do very well. More general question, are most of your animals born in captivity? That's a really good question. Um, we're actually gonna talk uh, next, we're gonna talk about one of our animals that was not born in captivity. Um, so our animals generally have one of two stories. They were either animals that were born in captivity born at another facility um, or our facility in some cases, 
or they're animals that were born in the wild and then for whatever reason were injured and can't be released back into the wild. Um, so typically that's the, those are the two most common sources of our animals, um, where they come from and why they're specifically with us. All right, you guys have a couple more questions about Indy here. Any chance he might have a girlfriend? Oh, good question. Um, so no, that is unlikely um, for two reasons. One is that these guys are solitary animals. Um, he would not enjoy having another chuckwalla in his exhibit. He is by himself. Um, so he, if he, there was another chuckwalla, even if it was a girl chuckwalla, he would be real mad about that. Um, another one is we don't actually know that he's a boy. I'm saying he and that he's a boy. Um, with reptiles, it's really hard to tell whether they're male or female just from looking. So the most surefire way you know is either by doing medical procedures that let you see their internal anatomy, or if it lays an egg, it's female. <laughs> um, so be, um, so reptiles will lay unfertilized eggs. So even if it's just a girl by herself, she'll lay eggs. They just won't have a baby inside of it. Um, so we, since we've had Indy with us for about, gosh, five years now, he's full grown. Um, we're guessing he's probably not female because he's never laid an egg, but we don't actually know for sure. We're just kind of guessing. Um, so that's one reason. Another reason is he wouldn't like it. And two, raising babies is a lot of work. <laughs> So we don't want to have a whole bunch of baby chuckwallas, um, you know, that we might not have room for or that we have to now find homes for, right? We, we want to make sure that animals, that any animals are, you know, that they would be able to go into the wild or that they would have homes. And that's a really big process that we aren't able to do right now. Um, and, it, and because these guys aren't an endangered species, that's not really a priority. So conservationist scientists tend to want, we want to focus on those animals that really need the support increasing their numbers in the wild, which these guys don't too bad right now. What is Indy's most likely predator? His most likely, he has quite a few. Um, he's a pretty small dude. Um, so this would be a larger bird of prey, like a red-tailed hawk, um, might go after him, something like a coyote or a bobcat would go after him. Um, what else would he do? Those are probably the main ones. Even something like a raccoon, honestly, would probably go after him. What are you doing? You're so active today. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and swap Indy out here. So bear with me for a moment as I go off camera. All right, like I said, kind of bear with me. I'm getting our next animal and she requires a little bit of prep. So it's gonna take me a minute. No rush, this is incredible. <laughs> All right, last but absolutely not least, we have Mariah. So Mariah here is an American kestrel. An American kestrel is a bird of prey. So these are our birds that are predators, they eat meat. Um, so this group includes eagles, falcons, hawks, and owls. Um, so Mariah is, believe it or not, a falcon. So she is the smallest falcon in North America. So another falcon you might be familiar with are the peregrine falcons. Um, so she is still a falcon, even though she's very tiny. 
Um, she is full grown. This is her adult size. So they are very, very small birds of prey, but she still has all those characteristics you would expect to see in a bird of prey. So if you look at her beak, she's got that really sharp curved beak. And then if I hold her up here, you'll see she has those sharp talons as well. Those are going to be her main methods of catching and eating her prey. Another thing that defines her is her as a raptor is her excellent eyesight. So they've got really excellent eyesight. They're gonna rely on that again to find their food. Um, some of the things that specifically, oh, big sigh, yeah. So that, that shake there, that's basically if you took a big sigh, big breath and took a big sigh out and kind of relaxed, that's kind of what she's doing. Um, so that's really good. It means she's nice and calm and comfortable right now. Um, so a couple of the things that make her a falcon specifically is going to be one of the most noticeable is her wing shape. So if you look at her wings, they kind of come down to this sharp point here. This is different from, say, a hawk. If you look at a hawk's wings, they'd be more of a big U shape like this as opposed to that kind of sharp V. Um, and that's going to, um, that's due to the way that they fly. So hawks are going to be more soaring. So they're gonna get up high in the air and they're gonna use the air currents to just kind of hang out um, and look for their prey. Whereas falcons are much faster flyers. So falcons are gonna wanna drop down on their prey. And a lot of falcons will actually catch their prey in midair. So falcons like a peregrine falcon eats other birds and they'll catch their prey in midair very quickly. So Mariah here, um, is going to be eating in the wild. She'll eat mice and lizards, small lizards, um, and she'll also eat insects. Um, she likes crickets and mealworms. And I actually, I have snack. She sees it too. So I have snack for her. So these are mealworms. So they're just a small worm species um, and they are one of her favorite snacks. Want one? Tasty. Are you going to eat it? There you go. So they're her favorite snacks. So she has them here. Um, this is part of our training that we do with our birds. So she, as you can see, is trained to sit on my glove here to come out, hi, to come out and meet people. And she gets rewarded for doing that. So I want to make that worth her while to hang out here with me, as opposed to going out and looking for things to do. So one of the ways I encourage her to hang with me is by providing her tasty treats. So she's got mealworm on her beak. That's gross. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Mariah, we do know for certain that Mariah is female um, and that's due to her coloring. So kestrels, the males and females have different coloring. So Mariah, you can see those brown and black, almost tiger stripes going down her back. If she was male, she would have a whole lot of a really pretty blue-gray color also on her wings. She's got a little bit of it. If you can see the top of her head, she's got that little gray circle on her head. So if she was male, her whole head would be gray and she'd have big gray bands going down her wings as well. So it's really easy to identify the males and females um, separate from each other with this species. Um, the reason Mariah specifically is here with us um, is because as a chick, somebody actually took her from her nest in the wild and tried to keep her as a pet. Um, and so this is a bad idea for several reasons. Um, the big, one of the big ones is that it's against the law. It's illegal to keep raptors as pets. Um, but honestly, it's just kind of not a great idea. These guys aren't pets, they're wild animals. They are not snuggly. Mariah does not want to be petted or cuddled. Um, they need a lot of care. They need a lot of specialized food. They need a really big space to live. So they don't make very good pets. So this person um, was convinced to give her up, um, but because she was kept with people when she was young, she never learned to take care of herself like she would have in the wild. Her parents would have taught her how to find food and how to stay safe, um, how to talk, how to hang out with other kestrels, um, and she never learned any of those things. So because of that, she is what we call imprinted, and so she is non-releasable, which is why she is here with us.
So I think we're having we're having a little technical difficulty on our backup computer. So I give know, us a second. I know one question was okay. where can we find them in the wild? Good question. Um, so these guys are found all over North America. So you can find them anywhere in the country. Um, specifically, if you were looking for like what kind of habitat, you'd be looking for them in um, bushlands. So anywhere. So they don't like kind of in between. So they don't like it where there's just flat with a whole lot of grass, and they don't like it where there's you know really huge giant tall trees like a deep forest they like it kind of in between so kind of smallish trees bushes things like that that's going to be their preferred kind of habitat to hang out in and then how many babies would she typically have in a nest um in a clutch i believe these guys have three to five chicks in a clutch three to five eggs in a clutch So um, just a little bit about how I'm handling her and how I'm working with her. So you'll notice around her ankles, she's got those brown leather strips. So those are anklets basically. So it's just a piece of leather. And those are attached to jesses. Jesses, so there are these strips here that are attached from her feet down to the lead here. So this lead I have attached to my glove here. And so all of, and then I'm actually holding on to the jesses with my fingers. So all of these things are basically meant same as if you have a dog, you take your dog for a walk, you use a leash and collar. Sorry about that. Everybody looks like we're having a little, a little uh, technical difficulties with uh, our our falcon but um hopefully we'll be able to get this back up and running uh we only have a few more minutes uh, we had about a 45 minute session set up with uh with these animals and it's uh we're about 41 minutes in so uh we're, we're rolling in right on time as it as it comes but i uh, did want to talk a little bit about the living coast discovery center they are located down in chula vista just outside of uh, chula vista um close to the bay and uh they uh have a quite a large uh, site and, and many, as, as she said, just uh, the number of sharks, they have upwards of 30, uh, potentially 40 sharks. So it looks like we got them back on. So let's go ahead and- Hi, can you guys see All us right, again? she's back. All right, we got you, thank you. Hi, sorry about that. So kind of the trade-off of being on this awesome refuge and having all this wildlife around us is that our Wi-Fi can be kind of terrible. Right. <laughs> Do you mind turning your uh, your camera about ninety degrees? Oh, is it flips the screen? Interesting. Yeah, give us one second. No problem. I'm gonna just kind of wiggle it. Are you guys seeing it okay now? Yep, now we're good. So it looks like we're, we're still having a little bit of issue, but uh, again, the uh, Living Coast uh, Discovery Center in Chula Vista has a wonderful setup. Um, uh, obviously, uh, more than uh, two dozen sharks that will be available for everybody to take a look at. Um, and uh, also quite an assortment of birds. It, it's really a nice, a nice place to go and see some uh, of the birds that would be um, housed in, in you know, uh, some of the local wildlife specifically, but a, a wonderful place to, to, to check out. Unfortunately, they are, um, they are having, uh, oh, okay, now they're back. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> All right, we should be we should be okay. We think we've identified the problem. <laughs> you're, you're still 90 degrees turn, but you just continue on. Now you're upside down. Oh, we're upside down. There you go. There we go. Okay, we're good. 
So we are we are back. There we go. All right. Are there any questions in there? Not that I see. I'm not sure if, if any of the questions have popped up um, in the last couple minutes after somebody asked about the eggs in the clutch. If you wouldn't mind retyping those, sometimes they don't show up if we've been disconnected. Yeah, somebody did ask, how far can she see? How far can she see? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so the way that we generally talk about it is um, the metaphor that we use a lot of the time when we talk about birds of prey is we talk about if you imagine the bird, if you imagine a football field and you imagine the bird sitting in one goalpost, um, if she could read, she would be able to read a newspaper at the other goalpost. So if you kind of imagine the distance of a football field, that's kind of what she's what she's dealing with. And you'll also see her as she's sitting on my glove, you'll see her doing these little head bobs. Um, and that's actually a way, um, she's actually using that to judge distance. So she's looking around her and she's using that head bob to kind of judge how far away from her an object is and whether it's getting closer or if it's moving away. So it's one of the ways she can tell kind of what's going on if there's something big, if it's, you know, big and scary and coming towards her, you know, something she needs to be worried about. Because she is so small, she does have quite a few predators. Um, so larger birds of prey like Cooper's hawks or peregrine falcons um, would definitely be prey uh, predators for these guys. Um, when they're chicks in the nest, they have quite a few predators, um, snake species, um, any snake that gets into the nest would eat an egg. Um, a coyote or a bobcat would would get a hold of these guys if they could, if they can catch them. Um, so all of, especially a nest, um, all of those things can be predators for them. Good question, how old is she and um, how old will she live to? Yeah, so Mariah here is about 10 years old. Um, that is pretty old for a bird of prey in captivity. We would expect, we're gonna expect her to live into her late teens or early twenties. Um, and that's because, you know, in captivity, she's getting fed every single day. She gets to go to the vet, she's not feeling well. So all those things are going to extend her lifespan um, longer than the kind of average lifespan in the wild. Um, we typically say the average lifespan is five to seven years for a bird of prey. Um, that doesn't mean that they only live seven years. It, um, that average is so low because a lot of um, birds of prey don't make it to their first year. Being a small raptor, they're very vulnerable at that point. So um, that's the reason the average is so low. In the wild, we'd probably expect her, if she everything went well for her, you know, she was able to find food and stay healthy, she would also probably live to her maybe her early teens. Yeah. Settling in. Does she use her talons for hunting? Yes, absolutely. So in the wild, she's going to be using her talons to hold on to her food. And actually, in captivity, she'll do that too. Um, she's going to be using her talons to, that's what she'll use to actually catch her food, so to like grab onto it. And that's also what she'll use. Whoop, hi. Hello. Was that scary? All right, well, she's gonna show off her wings for you guys. Um, so that's what we call baiting. Uh, when she goes off the glove and you saw, that's why I have the lead, so she settled in. So there may have been a loud noise, a, a noise or something she saw that kind of spooked her. Um, so she's gonna settle back in in a minute and maybe she'll take a snack. There we go, everything's better with snacks. Um, so what was my question? Sorry, <laughs> I lost it. This is how old she lives too. No, it's after that. I was saying something I've lost. Oh, talons. Um, yeah, so she's gonna use her talons to hold, to catch her food. So that's what she'll use. If it was like a mouse, that's what she'll use to actually grab a hold of that mouse. Um, and then she'll use her talons and her beak, basically like a knife and fork. So you, she'll use her talons like the fork to hold on to the mouse. And then she'll use her beak like a knife to pull off smaller pieces for her to eat. Um, so in, in this case, you're not seeing her use her talons and that's because these mealworms are so small. 
it's also because I'm holding it for her. If I was to, if she was to get like a really big mealworm or she didn't get a really good grip on it, she would use her talons to grab onto it so she could get a good bite. But since I'm holding it for her, she doesn't really need to. Well, okay, Junani, we only have a couple minutes left. So I did want to give you an opportunity to talk about anything that living, uh, regarding Living Coast Discovery Center and how maybe you guys are adapting to COVID. And uh, we definitely in, enjoy these virtual um, educational seminars that, that you're able to provide us. But anything that you wanted to give us in some closing thoughts uh, about the center or anything that you guys are working on? Yeah, so right now we're doing a lot of our virtual programming, like what you guys did today, you know, meeting our animals, doing some of our kind of school programs virtually. Um, we aren't able, we're not open to the public right now, but we are doing private tours for one family group. So if you want to come check us out, come see the animals, you can get a private tour for you and your family to come, come out here for a couple of hours and, and see what's going on. Um, so that's kind of what we got to go. We've still got our animal care staff is still here every day taking care of the animals. Um, we have a couple of endangered species that we are currently doing breeding programs with working with San Diego Zoo Global. So we have um, Ridgeway rails and burrowing owls. Um, so those breeding programs are still going on. Um, so if you follow us on social media, You'll get to see updates for that and um, hopefully um, by you know coming into the spring and the fall we're, we're going to start seeing um, nests and chicks and all that fun stuff happening so um, as long as we you know if we can't have people on site we'll be trying to keep everybody in the loop on social media so yeah and a really exciting thing for the bridgeway rail project is um, just i believe it was just this last week um, our team with the u.s fish and wildlife service released I think it was about 15 chicks that we raised here into the wild um, around San Diego County. So, um, you know, even though we can't have people here, uh, we do have a lot of um, teams. Uh, our team is working hard with those um, reintroduction programs. So wonderful. Well, I'll tell you as a as a personal fan of your of your center, uh, I miss I uh, miss uh, being there and, and seeing all the animals that you got. So we're really looking forward to you guys opening back up to the public and uh, we're going to do our best to try to keep you guys going and, and really enjoyed today's presentation. Thank you so much for, uh, for attending and uh, we will very much look forward to see you soon. Thanks. We appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody. Bye. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.